Okay, yes. Um, hi, I'm Karen Ruiz and welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. For those in person and on Zoom, thank you all for being here and thank you Chandra, especially for uh, Zooming in tonight and guiding us through these precious teachings. Um, it's really an honor for you to be here, so thank you. Um, are there any newcomers here? I don't think so. Oh, I see one hand online, yay. Susan, hi Susan. Um, well, for Susan and a reminder to the others is that we are a Donna based practice group. So this is completely funded by your generosity and is made possible by that. So every dollar counts and um, it is a practice. So give generously with your heart and mind and open those wallets and um, yeah, we could really use it. So um we have a suggested donation on a sliding scale of like $20. So around $20, you can go up to 40, you can go down to 10, but somewhere around there would be amazing. And no one is ever turned away for lack of funds. Okay, let's see. This month, we are starting a Dharma love drive, and we are trying to increase the number of monthly donors. So you can do this by going to our website, San Francisco or sfdharmacollective.org and click the donate button and click the little box that says monthly and add your amount. And some of the ways to think about this monthly donation that I've liked, uh, one of them was your hourly wage. So somewhere in and around your hourly wage, if you're working. Other ways to think about it is your Netflix subscription, your Amazon Prime subscription, all of your streaming services. Um, and another way that really hit home for me was the latte one. I really was surprised that I spend like $80 a month on like oat milk lattes. And so I am pledging uh, this month to start giving because I'm not a monthly donor. And so I'm going to start giving $50 a month. Um, so please hold me accountable to that. And hopefully others will join me. And one cute little story as I was practicing this Donna talk um, with my son, when I was leaving, um, he ran up and he gave me a $50 bill and like shoved it in my hand and said, here, mom, here's $50. It's for the Dharma Collective. And so it was so sweet. And you just like where your generosity is going to influence people. And it was, I almost cried and I'm going to put it in the box tonight and also really pledged to make a $50 donation. And so, um, yeah, show your love to the Dharma Collective, become a monthly donor. Um, we really appreciate anything. And for announcements, we have a uh, TIGS class, bringing mindfulness home is canceled next week and is on a hiatus until he is closer to the Bay Area. And um, we actually have, oh, and Susie Keeley's monthly class is next Wednesday at 5.30. And we have three new classes, or two classes and one programming note. Um, Augusta, uh, Mindful Mondays with Augusta Hopkins and her SF Sangha is beginning on Mondays at 5.30. And um, Yoga with Joe is starting on Wednesday at four. And that, those are both weekly classes. So every Monday at 530 and every Wednesday at four are two new classes. And the yoga is a very gentle yoga for everyone and all abilities. And um, Augustus class starts February 13th and Joe's class starts February 15th. And also on the 15th is Eve's uh, first happiness hour where uh, she's invited everyone to go grab a burrito or a snack and meet at the center at 6 p.m. an hour before the class to chat and build community and sangha and have a good time. And um, then class will start at 7. And that first happiness hour is the February 15th. So I think it's two Wednesdays. I don't think it's next week. I think it's the 15th. Is that right, Noam? Do you know? Anyway, I'll I double check. Think it's, I actually think it's next week. 
but I'll double oh, check it? and put it in the chat. Okay, my bad. Well, maybe happiness hour is next Wednesday for the first time. So um, please come to that. And I think uh, that's all. Sorry, it took a long time. But um, thank you so much for being here, Chandra. It's lovely to see you. Thank you. Good to see you too, Paige. And I love that Donna talk. <laughs> I love it. I love the personal examples. And is 50 bucks your son's hourly wage? No, I'm kidding. I know you were practicing that, but that'd be cool. Yeah, he's 10 and he's already doing I wish. Tech or something right? or, or on TikTok doing dance videos. Yeah. Um, yeah, that'd be fun. How old's your kid? He's eight. <laughs> He's eight, and he was. He said, "Mom, I don't need it. I'm only eight years old. I don't need much money." And so I was like, "I can't take this." And he was like, "No, please do. Please do take it. I don't need it." And so I, I'm going to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna put it. And he owes you really a lot, Chandra, for having a more regulated mother. So. Mother, right? Who <laughs> feeds her demons on a maybe four to six yeah. week period of time. <laughs> Yeah, Very feeding nice. your demons really helped me when I was parenting young children. That's for sure. Good. Well, I'm glad. not just feeding your demons, but meditation can be helpful, of course. That's sweet. That's sweet. I love the personal stories and the encouragement. And yeah, I um, I think I need to up my monthly membership too. I think I used to be, but I don't know if I still am. So I will follow up on that too. I think even if we can give even just a little bit in spirit, being a part of the web feels so good. So, um, I thought what we would do tonight first, let's just take a moment and drop in and take some deep breaths and land in our body and our breath in this moment. I'm just, I get this sense of gratitude, right? For this moment we're all here together i mean what a miracle so much to be grateful for even though there's probably also a lot to to mourn or to complain about but you know there's always something we can be grateful for if not many things so maybe list a few you know one to three internal what are you grateful for Yeah, and we can arouse our bodhicitta, our heartfelt wish to practice together and individually for the benefit of ourself and all beings. There's a mudra. If you like, you can take it. It's put the two palms together, and then the middle fingers stay up. The other fingers wrap around, you know, cross. Thumbs are parallel, pointing up. And this symbolizes, you can put it at your heart. The single pointed intention. Let that, those fingers, those two middle fingers, be like a lightning rod for your bodhicitta, a single pointed intention to channel your energy, your wish, your heart to be of benefit in some way, not just in some kind of abstract way, but, you know, being more patient with our kids or taking each step in more mindfulness or friending our anger, whatever that is for you. That single pointed intention to be of benefit in some way, large and small. Bodhicitta. Thank you. So I have my space heater on because it's cold in my garage slash office can you hear a hum is that distracting or is zoom canceling that out it's okay okay good all right so tonight is feeding your demons and i first of all commend you for coming i know it can sound intimidating or like why would i want to do that but what i always say is it's actually way more fun than it might sound if if that's something that sounds a little 
intimidating for you in a sense where we get to go in and we get to befriend what things that we normally push into the corner or hide. And there's something so liberating about that. And the structure of the five steps of feeding your demons is such a nice, safe container for moving through the stages of meeting, befriending, dialoguing with, becoming, speaking as the demon, and then learning from the wisdom of that energy and embodying the liberated aspect of the demon, which is the ally. And then also meeting the ally, asking that some ally some questions, then getting to embody the ally and answer those questions as the ally. And then in the end, we return to our original seat. We dissolve the ally into light. That light dissolves into us. And then we rest in awareness. So this five steps is a really beautiful, safe container, you could say. So this sangha is a safe container, but also the five steps of feeding your demons is a safe container, a courageous container, but one that is uh, well worth exploring um there's this word the alembic that i've learned recently because there's a dharma center that's opened up in the east bay that i'm teaching at now it's called the alembic and what that means is the alchemical vessel where transformation okay. occurs and in a way this is what we're doing here too with the meditation with dharma in general but also within this five steps of feeding your demons we're practicing alchemy and um, and apparently the alembic, which is this cool kind of distillation thing, you could Google it. What does an alembic look like? You'll see some images. It was invented by a, a woman a couple centuries ago. I, I don't know all the story about it, but I thought that was pretty cool. So what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about an aspect of feeding your demons that I don't really talk that much about explicitly when I give my intro talk but i thought we should just go right for the jugular and talk about the fruition or the last step because the first four steps in the five steps i'll guide you through them just follow along your eyes will be closed for the whole time if that feels comfortable for you some people don't feel comfortable with the eyes closed you can leave them slightly hooded that's okay the point is first four steps you'll be guided through it into the fifth step, which is resting in awareness. And another way to say that or articulate that is called direct liberation. So I wanted to read a little bit about this fifth step, which is the fruition of feeding your demons, let alone the fruition, or not to mention the fruition of Dharma practice. Right? So the feeding your demons, the first four steps is this kind of gestalt based dialogue, empty chair, therapeutic method meets tantric Buddhism blended in a really cool way to get yourself ready for a good juicy sit, you know, because sometimes it's hard to just walk off the street and sit down and actually like feel like it's happening you know in my experience usually we spend the first 20 minutes or so <laughs> getting going through the reruns of the day and then maybe the dust settles and then things start really getting good around 20 minutes in and then the teacher rings the bell and you're like oh but it was just getting good <laughs> but feeding your demons is another way to kind of let the dust settle to do our internal housekeeping and then rest so this fifth step called resting in awareness is the main practice, one could say, is what makes feeding your demons more of a Buddhist practice than something like gestalt therapy, empty chair therapy, which some of you may know, may be familiar with. I have benefited from that. I did that with a therapist a couple of decades ago, actually, switching positions, dialoguing with, you know, fragmented aspects of yourself, maybe a part you haven't welcomed in, an angry child, a jealous partner, whatever aspects of yourself that you need to dialogue with to gain wisdom in. So feeding your demons isn't revolutionary in that sense, although it has a Buddhist flavor that's super cool. But what makes it explicitly more of a Dharma practice is this fifth step, 
And so she, and Lama Tsultrim, my teacher who developed this practice, calls that resting in awareness. But in the 18th chapter of her book called Feeding Your Demons, here, which I highly recommend, Feeding Your Demons by Tsultrim Alioni. In the 18th chapter on natural liberation or direct liberation, she goes deeper into what that fifth step is and what it is that we do, and then how to actually access the fifth step immediately without going through the four steps. So I'm going to read a little bit for you, talk about it, and then we'll do the five, the full five steps. Okay. All right. So, yeah, somebody there? Maybe make sure the mute is off. Dharma, I think, yeah. Good. Okay, everybody's muted. Okay, so there's a quotation. She starts a chapter, Lama Sultram starts a chapter. This is page 237 of the English version of Feeding Your Demons, chapter 18, with a quotation from the Buddha. And he says, seeing the frightful transformation of Mara's army, the pure being in caps, so that means the Buddha, recognizing that, recognizes them all as a product of illusion. I'll say that again because that was a clunky start. But Mara's army is basically, um, Mara is the manifestation of hope and fear or the uh, ego in a psychological interpretation, you know, in Buddhism, they say he's like the devil, but really don't reify the devil as some evil being out there. Mara is like the Buddha's fear manifesting his insecurity manifesting to him along the way, especially on the eve of his enlightenment, when he's just about to gain full liberation, the ego comes in because it senses its impending doom and it doesn't want to die. So it creates this whole illusion, illusion. And there's all sorts of stories about what Mara does to do that. And one of the things is to send his armies. Okay, so I'll start again. Seeing the frightful transformation of Mara's army, the pure being recognizes them all as a product of illusion. There is no demon, no army and no beings. There is not even a self. Like the image of the moon in water, the cycle of the three worlds is misleading. Three worlds could be interpreted in a few different ways. We could just say past, present, and future to keep it simple. There's also the desire realm, the formless realm, and the form realm. We don't need to get too up in that business, but to say that this cycle of samsara, past, present, future, different manifestations, is misleading in the sense where it appears to be real, but really it's an illusion, just like the moon and water. So you guys are dharma. I think everybody has some foundation, if not a lot of foundation in Buddhist practice. And you're familiar with this idea of like no self, right? It doesn't mean you're not over there and I'm not over here and karma doesn't matter. Like, yes, all of that's true. Karma matters. I'm over here. You're over there. But under deeper investigation and analysis, a little nugget or mini me in here called Chandra or Noam doesn't truly independently exist separate from all the other causes and conditions that bring about these people or things or experiences everything's interrelated impermanent without an intrinsically existing identity or selfhood so in this way we can see into the empty nature of demon mara self beings so what she says is that you know up until now in the previous chapter she touched upon the core demon of egocentricity, which is one of the main teachings on demons is that like the root demon is that egocentricity, meaning ego clinging. It's dak zin in Tibetan, meaning dak is self, zin is to cling. So it's that, that, that 
kind of almost like biological programming we have to like cling at the self. We want to protect it. We don't want it to be hurt. Um, and that's fine. On a relative level, that's great. Survival depends on it. But if you're interested in liberation, you have to understand that that's an illusion and that this separate sense of self that needs to be protected is like a moon reflected in water. It's illusory. So she explained that in the prior chapters, as well as this idea of consciousness or true nature, the true self, more with a capital S, is being pure consciousness, free of ego clinging, more of the expansive sense of consciousness, rather than the small, myopic, contracted sense of self. So she's explained all of that in the prior chapters. And all of that creates a framework for understanding the key concept of this chapter called direct liberation. So once we have practiced feeding your demons for some time, we begin to become aware of demons as they form, like on the spot, like in the moment. Have you experienced that to be true? Those of you who've done it before, you may be more readily to see like, oh, that's a demon. Maybe you're getting in a fight with your partner. Oh, that's a demon. I used to, I used to, with my ex, we'd start, maybe we'd start to fight or argue. And I'd say, wait a minute, I feel like I'm triggered. Like there's a, there's a demon in here that I'm like, the demon is speaking right now. Can we just take a pause? I'm going to go feed a demon <laughs> and I come back and engage. He's like, cool. Yeah, I'll do that too. <laughs> and it helped us in our relationship. And then we could engage more from an authentic place of truth and heart rather than the reactivity mm -hmm, of the so-called demon. Okay. So as you do this practice more, you start to see them more as they right as they're about to pop up and form rather than sort of it being too late and you realize you've just you know rained on the parade um we learn to see the demons coming and recognize them as they get a hold of us this makes it possible with practice to liberate demons as they arise without going through the five steps by using what is called direct liberation. This most immediate and simple route to liberating demons takes you straight to the fifth step. So I'm just going to give a couple examples about how that actually works. Sounds easier than it actually is, but be open to the possibility because sometimes it actually just happens. And you don't even have to be like a maverick feeding your demons practitioner. She says, direct liberation is deceptively simple. It involves becoming aware of a demon and then turning your awareness directly toward it. It is the energetic equivalent of turning a boat directly into the wind when sailing. The boat stops because its power source has been neutralized. Similarly, if you turn your awareness directly into an emotion, the emotion stops developing. This doesn't mean you are analyzing it or thinking about it, but rather turning toward it with clear awareness. At this point, if you are able to do it correctly, the, the demon will be instantly liberated and vanish on the spot. The technique of direct liberation is comparable to being afraid of a monster in the dark and then turning on the light. When the light goes on, we can see that there is no monster. We shine the light of awareness on a demon and it disappears. So later she says here, what we're doing is we're short circuiting the demon as it arises by meeting its energy with awareness as soon as it surfaces. This is the fifth step, direct liberation. So she gives a, an experiment here. So I want to guide you through this direct liberation experience before we go back to the first step and do the whole process. So let's, as the experiment, go ahead and close your eyes. 
It just takes a second here. So just close your eyes, take a few breaths, settle in. And then consciously bring to mind a strong emotion. Maybe it's anger or sadness, jealousy or desire. Bring to mind a strong emotion. And when it really feels strong or strong, as strong as it's going to get, intensify it even more. And then turn your awareness directly into that emotion. And rest in the experience that follows. Turn your awareness directly into that emotion and rest in the experience that follows. This is kind of so simple. It can be so instantaneous. Um, Sometimes for me, it feels like a bubble that pops, right? And then there's space that remains. Or that feeling might no longer feel like it has you by the jugular. Maybe you feel more space around it. It might not be gone completely, but you might have some more perspective or spaciousness or humor even around it. And if not, that's okay too. This might be your first time trying this. But she says, if you've done it correctly, the emotion will have dissolved. So you can practice this. You can kind of consciously, we do this a lot in meditation where you consciously think of a thought and then consciously look at the source, location, and destination of that thought or feeling. See if you can really pinpoint it. Is it a solid thing that teaches us about impermanence? So in the same way, you can consciously think of one of your demons. Oh, earlier today, I got frustrated at my kid. That's not so hard to pull back up. And it is like turning that boat back into the wind, turning your awareness to look at it. And in a sense, that diffuses that downward or forward momentum, that projectile momentum, out, out, out. The world is the problem. You're the problem out there. And so in a way, this turning and looking is like neutralizing the power source. So I I wanted to share that with you because lately I've been talking about how what I love about Dharma is that, I mean, you might have different experiences with Dharma, but the experiences I've had with Dharma is that they tell you the fruition from the very beginning. It's not like they're holding out. Like, you know how if you buy something online, then you buy it and they're like, oh, but don't hang up yet. You know, don't don't click away yet. You could buy three more for only $50. You know, they keep wanting to sell you more and more and more things. Oh, they hook you in and they keep leading you on. But in my experience, Dharma doesn't lead you on. It tells you the fruition right away. And so that's what I wanted to share with you. The fruition right away. Direct liberation. You can do this on the sidewalk, in the car, at the stoplight. You know, a lot in the Lojong teachings, if you've done those with us in mind training, we we take our practice into every moment as much as we can, you know. Road rage. Okay, instead of getting consumed by that, take that as an aha moment. Like, oh, here's a lot of anger. I can practice patience. Gratitude for that jerk who just cut me off because now I get to practice patience. So in the same way, You could do the direct liberation in those same moments. Oh, here's the anger. It's hot in my body. Well, okay, turn awareness. Look at it. It's like a phantom, a castle in the sky, an echo. All these analogies of the illusory appearances of phenomena. 
but hold this lightly. Of course, please do not beat yourself up about it if you didn't get it or it's hard to understand. Just try it. Hold a light touch with it. Okay. Any questions or comments before we jump in? What is a demon? Demon is that which blocks your experience of freedom. So start to think about what you want to work with, what's blocking you. Could be small or big. You're going to do this all internally. You don't have to talk to anybody about it right now. It's like you might be in the group, in the sangha. You might be home alone, but you're going to be guided. It's a solo journey. So make sure your notifications are off, your door is closed, your family knows you're you're going to go deep, so bug off. <laughs> Claim your space. You deserve it. So that's so that is so if demon can be mental, emotional, physical. It could be chronic pain. It could be thoughts that loop around. I'm not good enough. That's basically the core one. <laughs> uh, I'm unlovable. I'll never succeed. Whatever, you know, what's blocking your experience freedom or emotions? Maybe. Maybe you tend towards jealousy or competitiveness. Maybe you just, you're just just always angry or depressed, anxious. You can work with habits like addictions, habit like action addictions or consuming substances addiction. That's a, those are great things to work with with feeding your demons. It can be a minor thing, like from on a scale from one to ten, you might feel like you know i'm feeling a little fragile tonight maybe i'll maybe i really only feel like i have the capacity to work with a two or three or four level challenge or maybe you're like you know i am just ready to face this thing my core demon my parent wound or the critic or whatever go for it often those really strong ones will yield in a sense, the most alchemical transformation, but not always. Sometimes the small ones give us very deep, beautiful revelations too. This is very somatic in practice. You're going to feel the body a lot. It's not a thinking, figuring it out mentally. It's very somatic. So I'll guide you through this now. Um, I'm not getting any chats or hands raised i see a cat which is the cats always want to come along and be with you when you're doing healing work hi yes good yep yep our little allies okay so best way to learn is to just do it so let's dive in okay so go ahead and close your eyes. We'll do some relaxation breaths. And if you don't know exactly what you're going to work with tonight, don't worry about it. You'll have some time. Um, if you're on Zoom, one thing I like to suggest, by no means required, is to actually like show me your parallel, show me your profile. <laughs> so you can turn your chair, start like this, because at some point I'm going to ask you to change positions and face the opposite direction so you can pivot your chair or sit in another seat and then i can see your other profile that's how i can kind of just be with you and and see you make sure things are happening or okay um but if you want to turn your video off you're welcome to do that too okay yeah and if you're in the room if you guys know you'll have an empty chair or a cushion or if you're alone, have an empty chair or cushion in front of you because you'll switch places. If you don't have room to have an empty chair or cushion in front of you to switch places in, you can also, when I tell you to switch places, you could just stand up out of your seat and turn to face your original seat standing. That's also an option. Okay. Okay, my friends, let's close our eyes. Start to take some deep breaths. We start with the nine relaxation breaths. 
The first three breaths are breathing into any physical tension in your body. With the in-breath, drawing the breath into any physical tension. And then releasing that tension with the out-breath. Feel that tension melting into the earth beneath you. And then with your next few breaths, breathe into any emotional tension. Feel where you hold emotional tension in your body. Breathe into it and then release it with the out breath as much as possible. Feel that tension melting into the earth beneath you. And then with your next few breaths, breathe into any mental tension, worries, concerns, feel where you hold mental tension in your body. Breathe into it. And release that tension with the out breath. Feel mental tension melting into the earth beneath you. And then give rise to a heartfelt motivation to practice for the benefit of you, those around you, even all beings. If you wish, you can take that bodhicitta mudra again of single-pointed intention, personal prayer, motivation. And now let's spend a few moments to land on what you'd like to work with tonight. Maybe it's something that's close to the surface, something that's been gnawing at you, bugging you, holding you back. Take some time here to scan your body, feel into your heart. What's blocking your experience of freedom? You may be feeling a handful of different possibilities of what you could work with. Please land on one specific thing tonight. Perhaps feeling what's closest to the surface, what feels most strong in you right now in this moment. You can work on the others at another time.
And when you've decided what you'd like to work with tonight, feel where it lives most strongly in your body. Maybe it's a specific place, one place, or maybe it's spread out or more diffuse. A couple places, just feel where this energy, where this block, so-called demon lives most strongly in your body. And then notice the shape of the feeling. Notice the color of the feeling. And what is the texture? What is the temperature of the feeling? Hot, cold, warm, neutral? What is its density? Is it dense, thick, or more effervescent, like light? And now, just for a moment, intensify this feeling, perhaps remembering how you felt when you felt it most strongly last. And now the next step is to allow this feeling, this shape, color, texture, and so on, 
Allow this feeling, this so-called demon, to move out of your body and become personified in front of you as a being with limbs, a face, eyes, and so on. It might be helpful to make a gesture with your hands to help feel moving that energy out of the body. where it becomes personified as a being in front of you. And then notice, what do you see? What is the size of this so-called energy, this demon? And if what you see is an inanimate object, then imagine what it would look like if it were personified as a being, because we're going to dialogue with it. This is called the subjunctive tool, what would it look like if it were personified as a being with eyes, limbs, and so on? What is its color? And what is the surface of its body like? What is its density? Does it have a gender? And what is its character like? What is its emotional state? What is the look in its eyes? Mm 
And then notice something about it that you didn't see before. Now you're going to ask this so-called demon some questions, one by one, after me, out loud, whether you're in a room with others or alone, speaking out loud is fine, without waiting for the answer, because you'll switch positions and become the demon and answer as the demon. So repeating after me, one by one, what do you want? What do you really need? That's the need beneath the want. And then how will you feel when you get what you really need? Having asked the questions, immediately switch places, taking that empty seat in front of you or simply stand up and face your original seat and become the demon now. Personify, become that demon. Feel what it's like to be in the demon's body. You may want to take a gesture, an expression, a stance to embody the energy of the demon. Don't be shy here. Really embody. Really let it come alive in you. And notice what it feels like to be in the demon's body. And notice how your normal self looks from the demon's point of view. And now you'll answer those questions speaking as the demon. I'll say the beginning of each answer, but then you repeat the beginning and complete the answer. This time, if you're in the group at the, at the center, do this internally. Don't speak it out loud. If you're in your own room alone, you can speak out loud. So speaking as the demon, really feel connected to the energy of the demon. You are the demon now. And answering these questions now as the demon. What I want is.
what I really need is, this is that deeper need beneath the want, more of the core. What I really need is When I get what I really need, I will feel. When I get what I really need, I will feel. Really landing on that feeling the demon would have when it got what it really deeply needed. And take note of that answer. Take note of the feeling. And then when you're ready, keeping the eyes closed as much as possible, switch back to your original seat. And take a moment to settle back into your normal self and see the demon in front of you once again. And now either imagine that your body dissolves into nectar or that you create an infinite supply of nectar in any way that feels true and organic for you. In either case, this nectar flows from you to the demon, feeding it to complete satisfaction. Noticing how the nectar appears. Is it fluid, light, mist, ice cream, water? Noticing the color of the nectar. And the nectar has the quality of that feeling the demon would have when it got what it really needed. So if it was love, then the nectar would be nectar of love and so on. Feed the demon to complete satisfaction, an unending supply of nectar flowing from you to the demon.
And notice how the demon takes it in. Does it drink it, swim in it, absorb it through its skin, pores? And if it resists it, you could even co you could kind of like nudge it and say, look, you've resisted for so long. And where has it gotten you? How would it feel to take in the nectar, the attention, the love, the care? Feed the demon a complete satisfaction. Notice what happens as the demon takes in the nectar. Does it dissolve completely? Does it shape shift? Really feed the demon the nectar to complete satisfaction. And if it's dissolved completely, We'll move to the next step. If it's still there, feeding, for the sake of our group practice, I will invite you in another subjunctive tool to say, what would you look like if you were completely satisfied? What would you look like? Or what would you be if you were completely satisfied? And notice if there's a being that remains now. If it is, ask, are you my ally? Or if no being remains, or if it says, no, I'm not your ally, then invite an ally to appear before you now. Invite an ally to appear before you now. Notice what you see, even if it's not crystal clear, that's okay. We'll refine it as we continue. What do you see? What is the size of the ally? The color or colors of the ally?
Just trusting the imagery that arises. It doesn't have to make sense. There's no right or wrong here. Notice what is the texture of its skin? Surface of its body. What is the ally's density? Is it a body of light or human flesh and bone? What is its density? And does it have a gender? What is its character like? It's emotional state. A look in its eyes. And notice something about the ally that you haven't noticed before. So now you're going to ask the allies some questions, again, repeating after me, one by one, not waiting for the answer, because you'll switch positions and answer as the ally. So feeling connected with the ally in front of you, repeating out loud, everyone out loud, after me. How will you help me? How will you protect me? What pledge or commitment do you make to me? And how can I gain access to you? Having asked those questions, 
keeping the eyes closed as much as possible, switch positions and face your original seat, becoming the ally now. Feel free to take a gesture, an expression, a stance that helps you embody the energy of the ally. And really feel what it is like to be in the ally's body now. How does it feel? And then notice what your normal self looks like from the ally's point of view. Now, feeling yourself as the ally, you'll answer the questions quietly to yourself if you're in a group, or out loud is fine if you're alone. Speaking as the ally, I will help you by... I will protect you by... I pledge I will. And you can gain access to me by...
And is there anything else you as the ally would like to say? Any guidance? Wisdom? And then when you're ready, switching back to your original seat for the last time. And take a moment to settle into your normal self and see the ally in front of you once again. And then imagine that the ally with its benevolence, its care, its compassion, its power gazes upon you and feel that its energy pours into your body through the crown of your head, spreading all the way down to the soles of your feet. down into your fingertips, throughout your whole body. And now imagine that the ally dissolves into light. And notice the color of this light. And feel this light dissolving into you, integrating into every cell of your body. Notice how this feels, feeling of the integrated energy of the ally in your body. And now you, with the integrated energy of the ally, dissolve into open spaciousness and rest in awareness. Rest in the state that is present after the dissolution. It's natural liberation. If thoughts, other demons, other feelings come up to pull you away, just look at it and then let it dissolve. It's non-solid, effervescent expression of awareness is not a problem. Just look and then release and rest in awareness. Direct and natural liberation. This fifth step. Just rest. It's an undoing rather than a doing.
And then slowly begin to come back and to your form as your yourself feel the body on your cushion or your chair and the breath in your body. Coming back, feeling the clothes on your skin. But yet recalling the feeling of the integrated energy of the ally in your body. And then slowly begin to open your eyes. You could even look around you with the through the eyes of the integration of the ally energy in you. You and the ally are one. You are your ally. You always have been. Maybe you've just forgotten. Yeah. If we just take a moment and make a personal dedication of any benefit, any positive energy that's come from this practice, offer it up like a water droplet merging in the ocean of vast positive energy. It becomes limitless when we offer it, when we release it. It's dedicating the merit, positive energy of our time. Thank you. Well, uh, minutes here if anybody wants to share a reflection or put it in the chat. Um, I don't know if we can, if you do unmute, I don't know if we can do that now, but just try to be concise, right? So you could share a pithy or an insight that came or a question, or you can chat it in. Hi, Denise. You're welcome, my dear. Good to Good to see you here. Yeah, Noam says people can unmute themselves now if they want. You're welcome, Ted. Thank you, Aaron, Joshua, good. Who was here for the first time, first time feeding your demons? Ah, nice. I hope you enjoyed it. You know, Zoom, it can work, you know. Sometimes it's even nice to be in your own home <laughs> when you make this heroic journey. I hope you felt some benefit. I encourage you to journal. Sometimes if, when we have more time, we'll actually allow you to, you know, give you time to journal in the group. Oh my gosh, Alex, totally worth getting up at 3.30 a.m. You must be, where are you in Europe? Where in Europe? Sweden. Oh, good. You should do the Coppola training this summer. Do you know about that? It's the Feeding Your Demons training program I'm doing uh, at the Steiner Cultural Center outside of outside of Stockholm, um, June 30th. Yeah, check out my website. I'll just put it in here. It's up there right now. ChandraEaston.com. Even if you're not interested in getting certified, but you want to go deeper into the practice, it's it's a great training. It's a wonderful event. Nice people. Beautiful location. Good. Yeah, check out the registration page there. And um, the other thing before I let you go is something I'm excited about is um, an Esalen retreat that I do, that I'm going to do in March, March 17th to the 20th. And Esalen is in Big Sur. It's a beautiful location right on the cliffs of overlooking the Pacific Ocean with natural hot springs coming out of the cliffs. And it's really a classic 
Northern California spot. It's been there since the 50s, very counterculture, very much gestalt therapy was actually developed there through Fritz Perl and his colleagues. It's a beautiful place. Maybe some of you have been. I've been teaching there for 20 years. This will be my 20th year, I believe. And so this is a theme of one ground, two paths, two results. It's a beautiful Dharma teaching that we will explore in the retreat, the ground of being, our essential nature, and how we have a choice to remember, that's one path, or forget who we are, the other path. And based on the remembering path or the forgetting path, what the results are, the two different results. When we forget who we are, we experience samsara. When we remember, we experience nirvana. These are states of mind. And so we'll also do some feeding our demons because, you know, most of us have taken the samsara path. <laughs> so it can be helpful to work with feeding your demons there. And I'll do a little gentle yoga. I've taught yoga for 20 years. I always try to bring it into my retreat. So come with me if you want. There's still some space. Um, good. Thanks, Maria Walton. Oh, nice for your comment. Yes. Integrate the parts of myself that I may not always be so kind towards. Yeah. Sometimes a demon isn't such a bad thing, right? It's there for a reason. It wants to tell you something. Listen. Then it becomes the ally. Did you get? Did you have that feeling at the end that, oh my God, I'm my ally. <laughs> I can be my ally, my true self, my wisdom body is the ally. So you are the demon. You are the ally. They're expressions of you. So we don't want to get caught up in blaming the other, right? Blaming the spouse, blaming the boss, blaming the world. It's a, it's a, not a power position to be in blame, right? So when we take responsibility, we have more agency in our life. And feeding our demons helps to bring that more readily into our life. So thank you for having the courage to come. It's a pleasure to share this beautiful practice that has helped me personally so much. And I will hope to see you with, and not to far off. I might have to get surgery. I might um, not know. I don't know when that's happening in February or March. I'm not able to travel very far right now. Sitting for long periods of time are not easy for me. So that's why I'm not coming over there and why I'm pulling back on some of my engagements until I get this figured out. My book is done. It's off to the publisher. So now I have time to focus on my health. So my first, I basically hobbled across the finish line of the book, <laughs> but I made it and uh, now it's time to focus and I'm going to be okay. Like I said, hope and optimism. I have great appreciation for those more than ever now. We can get through it. And I, I know we all have our challenges. I'm not the only one. So big love to you all. And uh, I hope to see you next time. Eve is a wonderful steward. She will hold you with so much love and care and exquisite skill. So keep coming to Eve's classes every Wednesday. And I'll see you again when I see you again. <laughs> Big love. Bye-bye.